Good morning, everyone. And thank you, Linda. That was absolutely beautiful. Linda is joining us again this week as Terry is on vacation, and we are very grateful for your gift of music. So thank you for sharing that with us. I want to acknowledge that we worship this morning on the, the ancestral lands of the Anishinaabeg, specifically the Ojibwe and Chippewa peoples. And this land is covered by the Jay Collins Land Purchase and Lake Simcoe Treaty 16. It is my hope that we will all thoughtfully consider how we can live up to the treaties that were signed by our ancestors and how we can all live with respect for the original peoples and this land uh, we are so grateful for. There are some special days in our congregation to mark this week. Uh, Monday, tomorrow, is Jace Williamson's birthday, and it's so great to see his grandparents here back with us. That's wonderful. Um, Tuesday is Josh, Josh and Jesse Mullins' wedding anniversary, and Wednesday is Bob and Marg Rimke's wedding anniversary. So let's uh, sing to them all. I also want to um, pass on to you a message from Nancy McGregor. Many of you will remember that Ross, who, who was a, a faithful member of our congregation, died a few weeks ago, and Nancy wanted to pass on her gratitude for the notes and cards and donations that were made in Ross's honor. So on behalf of Nancy, thank you so much for your care and, uh, and your concern for her and your love for Ross. Uh, a reminder that we're receiving new members next week, and so if that is something that interests you, please let me know after the service, and we'll be in touch during the week. Uh, another big announcement is that on October the 2nd, Sunday, October the 2nd, at 3 p.m., we're going to be welcoming the members of the Reunion Choir from Fenland Falls, one of who is with us today, Helen's with us today, and um, also the Bearded Baritones. Uh, some of you might remember the Bearded Baritones. My, one of my son-in-laws is a member of the Bearded Baritones, and they're a, they're a uh, a barbershop quartet group of young men who, who have a lot of fun with their music and they've agreed to come uh, and sing for us again. So October the 2nd in the afternoon, we will be having it here in our church. Um, it's a free will offering, so no tickets are involved, but we would be grateful if you would um, spread the word, help spread the word. There are these, um, these posters that you could pick up on the way out. They're on the table at the front of the, of the um, entrance way there. If you have a place to post them, um, that would be most helpful. And tell your friends and family. We would love to have a good turnout for those two musical groups that are... Um, helping us with our fundraising. So thanks to them and, and thanks for spreading the word about that. This week, the world lost a great leader. And whatever anyone's political leanings are or feelings about the monarchy, I hope that Queen Elizabeth's unwavering commitment to duty and faith in those she served can be recognized as an example for all of us to follow. A friend of mine wrote, the queen continued to provide a sense of stability in a world that is increasingly polarized, angry, and vulgar. She conducted herself with grace, calm, and kindness. Now, I greatly admired the queen for her commitment to duty and to her family for her sense of humor and playfulness, which we're hearing a lot more about these last few days, and for her deep and abiding faith, even and perhaps particularly in times of challenge. May she rest in peace. I would now invite you, if you are able, to stand as we sing God Save the King.
be seated. Let's take a moment now just to quiet our hearts and our minds as we prepare to worship God. God calls to the lost, the least, and all who long for home. God calls when we wander from the path chosen for us and waste the gifts we've been given. God calls and welcomes us to worship this day. So let us celebrate and rejoice in God's presence. Let us worship God together. I would invite you to join in singing our introit in his time. I would invite you to turn your hearts to God in prayer. God of love and grace, what a blessing it is to worship together this morning. Here we discover your true character and your greatest <coughs> hopes for the world. Here we are reminded that we are sought after and welcomed, loved and forgiven and invited to rest in your care. May this time of worship fill us with grace, renewing us and transforming us so that we are made ready to go out into the world again. Move among us by the power of the Spirit and in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Merciful God, as we come together to worship you, we also have the opportunity to review this past week and the way we've lived it. We know that there were mistakes and failures, stresses and worries, disappointments and poor choices. We did not follow Jesus Christ as we meant to. We did not love others as we could have. So we ask that you would forgive all the ways that our lives did not reflect your love and mercy. Set us free now to begin again in the power of your grace and in the knowledge of your redeeming love. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray as we now say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Friends, know this about our loving and gracious God. God never loses hope for us. When we are lost, God is there on the lookout for us, bringing us back to God's heart like the good shepherd that God is. God's word tells us of the joy in heaven that awaits us. May this joy flow into our lives each day and be faithfully reflected into the world around us. Thanks be to God, our good shepherd, our great sweeper for this gift. Amen. 
Our hymn is Softly and Tenderly, which is number 640 in the Book of Praise. Well, while I was on vacation this summer, I had the opportunity to be at a friend's cottage for a couple of days, and they have a very interesting fire pit. Now, I love fires. Some of you will know that about me. That's the only, it's the closest I get to fire and brimstone are the fire, <laughs> fires in my fire pit. Um, this new uh, fire pit is made out of stainless steel, and it advertises itself as smokeless. And it actually is. I don't know how that works, but it actually is smokeless. And so you put the, you, you build a normal fire, you put the, the paper or whatever <laughs> substance you're using in the bottom, and then twigs or kindling, and then the big pieces of wood, and it burns absolutely beautifully, and it burns right down to the ash. It's a wonderful thing. The best thing about it, though, is that you can put this fire pit anywhere. We had a fire on the dock. 
and there was not a mark on the wood under the fire pit. It's kind of cool. But there's one thing that this fire pit can't do. If you put one piece of wood in, it will not burn. Because you need more than one piece of wood to make a fire, don't you? Similarly, one piece, one person can be easily <laughs> broken, but when you have a number of pieces of wood together, and this wasn't one of the smaller ones, if you have a number of pieces of wood together, you cannot break them. Now, I know I've shown you this illustration before, but I think it's always good to remember the importance of gathering together as a community. Just as one piece of wood cannot burn on its own, so it is really hard to be a disciple of Jesus on your own. Because we all have times when we feel like we're burnt out, like that one piece of wood burns out and there's nothing to get it going again. There's nothing to kindle the fire again. So it is so important as we start off this new church year to remember why it is important to gather together. Why sometimes I know that people have times when they don't feel like being in worship together. Maybe they're going through some challenges or they're feeling sad or grieving or depressed, but that's exactly when you need to be together in community so that others, when you don't feel like you can pray, others can pray on your behalf. When you can't sing, others will sing sing for you and you will be able to hear that song and once again feel drawn in to community and to the love of God. So I just want you to keep that image in your mind of the one stick that burns out or that roaring fire that keeps burning because they, the pieces of wood are together. And it is my hope that as a church community, we will continue to gather uh, and, and I really hope we will be able to gather in person um, this, this fall and, and build each other up and build our community up. So keep that image in your mind. Our hymn is number 485 in the hymn book, Savior Like a Shepherd Lead Us.
as we turn to read scripture, let us ask God uh, to bless our reading of God's word. Let us pray. O God, as we approach your word, may we hear love, grace, mercy, and joy in the call to follow Jesus Christ. Amen. Our lesson for today comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, verses 1 to 10. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. In the name of God the Father, our Creator, God the Son, our Redeemer, and God the Spirit, our Sustainer. Amen. Well, a number of years ago, I read a book entitled Our Lady of the Lost and Found. And I still smile when I think of the opening of that book. One morning in April, a middle-aged writer walks into her living room to water her plants and finds a woman standing beside her fig tree. As if that isn't surprising enough, this woman who's dressed in a navy blue trench coat and sensible shoes introduces herself as Mary, Mother of God. You know, Mary. And instead of a golden robe or a crown, she arrives bearing a practical wheeled suitcase and a sturdy purse over her arm, kind of like Mary Poppins. Understandably, she's tired after 2,000 years of adoration and people praying to her asking for help, and Mary's looking for a little R&R. She's asked in for lunch, and she decides to stay for a week. Now... I really enjoyed that book. I think it's a good one uh, for anyone to read because it's a thoughtful meditation on spirituality and our need for faith and our desire to believe in something larger than ourselves. And it's about the importance of community, having a community with whom we can share our faith. But it's the title that made me think of it when I read our gospel passage for this week, Our Lady of the Lost and Found. And I began to wonder, who was Jesus talking about in these stories that he told from our reading this morning? This series of stories about searching for the lost. Nadia Boltz Weber is a brilliant and quite irreverent preacher who I follow. And in one of her latest blogs, she notes that while having the Bible broken into chapters and verses makes it easier to find things and reference them, the Bible didn't come with them. As a matter of fact, there were actually no chapter numbers in the Bible until the 13th century, and there were no verse numbers until the 16th 
century. In other words, Jesus never sat down and divided his sermons into verses, chapters and verses. So it means, believe it or not, that you have permission to ignore those chapters and verses. Those separations were added hundreds of years later. Now, I think that thinking about the scriptures in this way can make a difference sometimes in how we hear the word of God. So I'll show you what I mean with our reading from this morning. Because our reading started at the beginning of chapter 15. But if you go back and read chapter 14, you'll find that it was filled with teachings about the importance of humility and inclusion and stories of how those who think a lot of themselves will not be able to be true disciples because they've lost sight of what matters the most. And then our reading from this morning at chapter 15 starts with the words, now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. So were they coming near to see how the Pharisees and scribes would react to Jesus' words? Were the Pharisees and scribes feeling uncomfortable because these outsiders were witnessing Jesus' scathing words? Is that why they were grumbling about Jesus welcoming sinners and eating with them? And by the way, just to be clear, we're all sinners. No doubt Jesus was shaking his head as he began to tell them yet another couple of parables to try to open their eyes, to try to get them to understand his message. In the first, a shepherd leaves his flock of 99 to look for a single lamb that is lost. And he searches until he finds it. And when he does, he carries that one lamb home on his shoulders and he invites his friends and neighbors over and he throws a party to celebrate. And in the second, a woman loses one of her 10 coins. Immediately, she lights a lamp and she sweeps her entire house, looking carefully for that coin until she finds it. And then, just like that shepherd, she calls together her friends and neighbors and asks them to celebrate the recovery of the coin. She says, rejoice with me, rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Now, in past years, I have preached this passage from uh, a more evangelistic and individualistic perspective, basically that we need to go out and find the lost and bring them into the fold. But my reading and my research this year brought me a new understanding of a way that we can look at this story. Debbie Thomas uh, writes, For a long time I thought that the lost lamb and the lost coin represented the unchurched or the unbelieving. People out there. The atheists and the naysayers. The folks beyond the fold, beyond the home country I call Christianity. But no, the lost lamb in the first parable belongs to the shepherd's flock from the very beginning of the story. It's his lamb. Likewise, the coin in the second parable belongs to the woman before she loses it. The coin is one of her very own. In other words, these parables are not necessarily about lost outsiders finding salvation and becoming Christians. These parables can also be about us, the insiders, the churchgoers, the bread and wine consumers, the Bible readers. These can be parables about lostness on the inside. Now, I think it's safe to say that we all feel it's much more comfortable to look at those who aren't like us and presume that they are the ones who God would consider to be lost, those who need to be saved and rescued if they're to be included in God's kingdom. But I'm not sure that's what Jesus is saying here. I think perhaps the message for us this day is that lostness isn't an experience exclusive to non Christians. I think we need to acknowledge that lostness also happens to God's people. It happens within the beloved community. It happens 
within the church. Once again, I want to share with you some words from Debbie Thomas. She says, it's not that we cross over once and for all from a sinful lostness to a righteous foundness. We get lost over and over again, and God finds us over and over again. Lostness is not a blasphemous aberration. It's part and parcel of the life of faith. But what does it mean to be lost? I think it means many things. Think for a moment about the ways you've wandered without even realizing it. The way you've lost your moorings and found yourself in a strange, frightening land with no markers to guide you home. Sometimes we lose our sense of belonging. We lose our capacity to trust. We lose our felt experience of God's presence. We lose our will to persevere. We lose the capacity to discern right from wrong. Some of us get lost when illness descends on our lives and God's goodness starts to look not so good. Some of us get lost when death comes to a loved one without warning and we experience a crisis of faith that leaves us reeling. Some of us get lost when our marriages fall apart. Some of us get lost when our children break our hearts. Some of us get lost in the throes of addiction or anxiety or lust or unforgiveness or hatred or apathy or bitterness. Some of us get lost very close to home within the very walls of the church. We get lost when prayer turns to dust in our mouths, when the scriptures we once loved lie dead on the page. Now, you may never have experienced such a feeling of lostness, but many have. Even Mother Teresa, that great saint of the church that so many of us admire, she went through years of feeling separated from God, of feeling lost. And so if you have, or if you are feeling lost, you're in mighty good company. And these parables are for you. Now Jesus, as usual, was brilliant in his storytelling because these stories are not so much about the sheep or the coin, but they're rather about the nature and character of our God. They're about a shepherd who risks everything to go and look, and about a woman who sweeps all night long to find. These stories are about a God who will always go looking for God's lost children, no matter what and no matter who they are. And let me be clear, I believe our God reaches out just as diligently and lovingly to those who are part of the beloved community as to those who aren't. God's love and care for us is not dependent on us and the decisions we make. The reality of God's love is non-negotiable for all of us. Another notable aspect of the stories that Jesus told that day is his choice of characters who, who represent God, those characters who save the lost item. He chooses a shepherd who stands at the very bottom of the socioeconomic scale in first century Palestine. And he chooses a woman with only 10 silver coins to her name. And when we think about that, I think we realize that these aren't just metaphors, but I think they're reminders that God works through very ordinary people to do the extraordinary work of helping to find someone and to bring them home. God, as the shepherd, wanders over hills and valleys looking for his lost lamb. God, as the sweeper woman, turns the house upside down looking for her lost coin. And when God at last finds what God is looking for, then God simply cannot contain that joy that seems to well up inside. And so God invites the whole neighborhood over and shares the happy news of what has been found and throws this party to end all parties. 
Now, any of you who have experienced losing a child in public might recall that feeling of joy when they are found. Now, other consequences might follow later, but it's overwhelming joy at the moment of reunion. And that's, I think, how God must feel every time anyone comes back into relationship with God or chooses to live up to their potential or helps out someone else or in all these ways becomes found again. God experiences joy, pure joy. But, you know, I don't think the Pharisees and the scribes get that. They don't realize that God is primarily about love rather than rules and therefore about joy rather than anger or fear or impatience or any of the other things that some people may have told you God is about. My friends, if you remember anything about these stories, remember the rejoicing on earth and in heaven any time one of the lost is found. Any time we in our ordinary lives can encourage one of the lost and bring them home to the family of God. Jesus told his disciples that he came that we might have life and have it abundantly. And I believe that abundant life includes joy and rejoicing in community, just as the shepherd and the woman did when they found what was lost. And that is the life God intends for all of us. So if you're feeling somewhat lost today, for whatever reason, Remember that God will not give up on you, ever. And to those of us who might not be feeling lost right now, perhaps the call is to open our eyes to those who just might be wandering in the wilderness or laying in the darkness, because that's just where we will find God. Because God is where the lost things are, where the lost people are. God is where lostness reigns. God is in the darkness of the wilderness. God is in the remotest corner of the house. God is where the search is at its fiercest. So if we want to find God, we have to seek the lost. We're being called to leave our places of comfort, to go and find them, to lift them up, to search in the darkness until they are found and brought home. And it is only then that together we can all rejoice. Amen. Our hymn is Amazing Grace, number 670 in the Book of Praise.
Let us once again turn our hearts to God as we offer our prayers for the world. <clears throat> o God of the lost and the found, we come before you in prayer, for you have sought us out and claimed us as your own. Thank you for showing us how precious we are to you through the life and the love of Jesus Christ. In our prayers now, we name before you other precious souls and situations. Eternal God, before you all generations rise up and fall away. And in your grace, you provide leaders to serve and comfort us with wisdom and dedication. On this day, we give you thanks for the life and Christian witness and service of Queen Elizabeth II, whose earthly life is now ended, and who has entered into the joy and peace you've prepared through Jesus Christ. We pray for her family and those who will take up her duties and responsibilities. Send your Holy Spirit to comfort and give peace to all who mourn her death and the death of any loved one. O oh God, we pray for those who feel lost in life, those who are frightened or anxious, those who are struggling with addiction or mental illness, and those who are lonely or despairing. We pray for those who have wandered away, for those separated from their families, by conflict or distance. We pray for those whose relationship with the church is broken or forgotten, and for those who've given up on the future in despair. We pray for those who feel forgotten, for those who think they're worthless or unloved, for those who believe that their sins are too great to forgive, and for those who are convinced that not even God can love them. We pray, God, for those who feel you have forgotten them because of the situations in which they find themselves through no fault of their own, those who are living with war, those who are living in the midst of natural disasters, floodings, drought, wildfire. Help them to know your love and care, even in these times of darkness. Ever watchful God, you keep seeking out wandering sheep and lost coins, lives of all who are precious to you. Thank you for your attentive love and your patient compassion for us all. May we rejoice with you when any soul, lost soul is embraced, and may we never substitute our judgment of them for yours. Make us servants of the mercy that we have learned in Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Friends, in the parable we read this morning, the woman who found the lost coin rejoiced over something precious. What we offer to God is precious to us. And when we present it to God, God responds with joy. So let us bless our offerings to God this day. I would invite you to join in singing the doxology.
Let us pray. Lord God, receive these gifts offered in a spirit of generosity and humility. Bless them and use them for the work that you long to do in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Our final hymn is Lord of All Hopefulness, which is number 748 in the Book of Praise. Life is short, and there is not much time to gladden the hearts of those who walk the way with us. So make haste to love, be swift to be kind. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of you and those you love this day and forevermore. Amen.